Welcome to Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change. I'm your guest host today, Elizabeth Candelario, and I'm delighted to introduce Hunter Lovins to you as well. Hunter is president of Natural Capitalism Solutions, professor of sustainable management at Bard College, and chief of impact at Change Finance. Now, I, I really think that Hunter is a woman that needs no introduction. Nonetheless, I want to share that Hunter has been recognized as Time Magazine's Millennium Hero for the Planet. Newsweek has called her a green business icon, and she was awarded the 2008 Sustainability Pioneer Prize by the European Financial Community. She's written literally hundreds of papers and 15 books, including her most recent work, a Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life, which I just finished reading truthfully this morning. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Hunter has spoken at the World Economic Forum. She's spoken to the U.S. Congress and the United Nations. She has an extremely diverse client list that includes Unilever, Walmart, Royal Dutch Shell, and the governments of Afghanistan, Bhutan, Canada, Jamaica, Germany, Sweden, and lots more. So we're very happy to welcome you here today, Hunter. Elizabeth, thank you. It is an honor to be at the epicenter. For both of us, for sure. Um, you know, I wanted to start by saying that you have been working in sustainability your entire career starting with a California conservation project back in 1973, I believe, when you were just finishing up your law degree. And you, so you were interested in the concept of sustainability, frankly, before just about anyone even had an idea that that was a thing. I don't even think the term sustainability was coined until 1972, or at least entered the U.S. lexicon. Right. Right. So what got you interested in the topic and propelled you on such an incredible professional journey? In some ways, I'm not sure that I had a lot of choice. My mother worked in the coal fields of West Virginia with John L. Lewis organizing mine workers. My dad helped mentor Cesar Chavez and Martin King. They were around the house when I was growing up. I grew up in the out of doors and watched throughout the 50s and then into the 60s, the, the real beginning of the environmental devastation, which now is becoming manifest to just about everyone. And it, it just seemed that trying to make the world a better place was what you did. It, it, it's what I've tried to devote my life to and have had along the way the opportunity of working with some of the greatest change agents on the planet and who continue to inspire me to this day. So you know, I've just been very lucky to have gotten into this early, although if I were any damn good, we'd have solved these problems. Uh, it, you know, whatever it is that I have done or not yet gotten done, this is not the work of any one person. This is the work that is going to require all of us. And so if any of you listening don't feel like uh, you have to have achieved anything particularly great to get involved, take a look at uh, little Greta Thunberg, 16-year-old woman who, who said, I am going to do something, and went and sat out in front of the Swedish parliament all alone for quite a long time until some others started to sit with her and then others around the world started to go and sit wherever they were. And September of 2019, 8 million people poured into the streets in support of what Greta was calling for, action on the climate crisis. And within months, the head of the big investment firm BlackRock was saying that when there are millions of people in the streets, we must take notice and committed BlackRock to begin to decarbonize. They have a long way to go, but hey, it's a start. Uh, within a month after that, uh, Microsoft announced that they were going to go not just carbon neutral, 
but carbon negative. They were going to erase all of the carbon emissions that the company had emitted over its lifetime by using nature-based solutions, things like regenerative agriculture. And we know how to solve the climate crisis at a profit between renewable energy and regenerative agriculture. Over 30 years time, we could get back to concentration of 280 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, which is the pre-industrial level, and we can do this profitably. So let's go. Let me take you back 12 years ago, and when you wrote the, a book with Paul Hawken called Natural Capitalism, Creating the Next Industrial Revolution. That book was really critically acclaimed, and it provided a framework from which one could make the case that building a sustainable economy is also good business. Exactly what you're saying now, coupling sustainability with profitability. Can you speak more about that? Sure. Uh, in, it was actually a, a few years before that, something like uh, 1995, uh, Amory Lovins and I wrote a piece that was going to become part of a book in German, which ultimately came out, a book called Factor Four, on the enormous savings that we can make with energy efficiency. And we sent the book off for peer review from all our friends and colleagues and Paul called up two days later. He said, rats, you just wrote half of my next book. I said, good, write the other half. This was written only about energy efficiency. There's a great deal more to sustainability. And it was written for a German audience. Let's write the book for the American audience. Paul said, great, we'll call it natural capitalism. I said, brilliant. He said, oh, no, it isn't. I mean the ism of natural capital. The services that intact ecosystems give to our economy. And people are going to take it as natural capitalism. I don't mean that. I said, too late. <laughs> it's a great title. We're gone. So uh, in 1999, the book came out. Uh, I, I'm told it was a New York Times bestseller. I really wasn't aware of that at the time. It sold millions of copies. The darn thing keeps selling for reasons I don't understand. It's now 20 years out of date. But uh, folks seem to think that it made a difference. Now, back then, we were going on guts. We believed, Paul had argued in 95, that the, the world is in crisis. Business is the only institution on the planet big enough, well enough managed, resourceful, enough to solve these problems. It is therefore the business of business to begin implementing more sustainable practices. This going on the old David Brower saying of you can't do business on a dead planet. And so we started gathering data. A man named Michael Russo, professor at uh, University of Oregon, had argued about that time that there was a business case for sustainability. There is, a, Ray Anderson, the, the great CEO of Interface, once said, what's the business case for ending life on Earth? So obviously there isn't one. But Mike was saying, business will make more money if it behaves responsibly. And so when we were writing Natural Capitalism, we sought to prove that this is true. At the time, it was widely believed that the, and Milton Friedman, the Chicago School economist, said this, the only social responsibility of a business is to deliver value, profit to owners. Full stop. Everything else is philanthropy. And... We were arguing that's not true. In 2001, a man named Walter Link and I, going off of a comment from Ray Anderson, Ray and I were sitting at a conference and he said, everything I'm doing to enhance the sustainability of my business is adding shareholder value. That wasn't the, re the reason Ray set out to make his company the first company of the next industrial revolution and hired a number of us to come in and help him do that. But when Ray said that, I said, 
what constitutes shareholder value? Obviously, if you can make more money, that goes directly to your bottom line. But if you are reducing the harm you're causing, you're also reducing the risk to the company in a whole array of ways. You're less likely to get sued, you're less likely to harm your workers. You are better equipped to attract capital. There's this, now this whole realm of impact investing. You attract and retain the best talent. You enhance labor productivity. Uh, Gallup Healthways has shown that a, an engaged workforce is up to 24 times more productive, 21 times more profitable. You are better able to manage your supply chain. This is why Walmart started going green. They have, what, 100,000 suppliers. They don't even know how many. When they published the sustainability scorecard, it gave them a way of differentiating between suppliers. There are, we counted 13 different reasons of what we call the integrated bottom line. You know, if you ask business, uh, John Elkington came out with this great phrase, the triple bottom line. Businesses should care about profit and planet and people. But if you ask a company to keep three separate sets of books, yeah, no. And when things are tough, what's going to go? People and planet. But if I can show you, as Ray argued, that behaving responsibly to people and planet is the route to enhanced profitability, now it's baked in, not bolted on. And he certainly went on to prove that with his own company in a way that becomes almost like a case study for a lot of the principles that you talk about in your books. Indeed, the, I think uh, in the original version of natural capitalism, we had four principles. I think there are three. Use all resources dramatically more productively, more efficiently, because this buys time. I was in a conversation once with uh, Dana Meadows, Danella Meadows, the great author of the book Limits to Growth. And I said, Dana, all this efficiency, does it matter if we keep having more people and we keep using more stuff? And Dana said, yes, it matters. It buys time. And time is what we're really short of. So that's the first principle. The second principle is to redesign how we make and deliver all products and services using approaches like Janine Benyus's biomimicry, Walter Stahel's circular economy. There are a whole array of ways to better design, better manufacture, better capture the waste that a product becomes when we're done using it in this circular economy. And then three, manage all institutions to be regenerative of human and natural capital in particular, the two forms of capital that we're losing. You know, I think the title natural capitalism works because the capitalism that we see around us in the world today is perhaps better called cheater capitalism. This is Randy Hayes's great phrase. We are taking natural and human capital and liquidating them in order to produce manufactured and financial capital, more money and stuff. And we are driving the world to the edge of a cliff. You have scientists now saying, we really may have only a few more decades left before we face total system collapse. We're in a global climate crisis. We have soaring levels of inequality, which Toma Piketty in the book Capital in the 21st Century showed is causative of economic collapse. And now we have a pandemic. Woohoo! The book Limits to Growth predicted that if we continue to have incursions into intact ecosystems, if we continue to lose biodiversity, we will have pandemics. So all of the, the crises that are facing us, for perhaps the most existential one being the climate crisis. These we have brought on ourselves by the unsustainable ways that we've been doing business. And as Dennis Meadows has said, 
If something is unsustainable, that means it will stop. Right. Now, I'm a mite sentimental about this human experiment. I'd like to see us solve these problems. And so what we were arguing in that book, and then even more so in, if you will, the sequel to it, A Finer Future, we have the technologies that we need to do this. And doing it will be profitable. When we wrote Natural Capitalism, we were arguing this is true. We now have the evidence. Behaving more responsibly to people and planet is just better business. I want to add one more thing, and believe me, we're going to get into a finer future, and we're definitely going to talk about COVID. But another thing that really stood out for me, Hunter, um, you know, there is that saying, we pay attention to what we measure. And what, what you've really pointed out quantitatively is we've been measuring the wrong things. And I think fundamentally that is a core concept that's very important to understand that gross national product is not, as you said, it's the speedometer, it's not the destination. Can you talk a little bit about, more about that? Sure. What do you want? When, when you think about your personal life, what do you want? And we actually know the answer to this statistically because these surveys have been done all around the world. And when you ask people that, they say, I want to be happy. What else do you want? I want to be healthy. What else do you want? I want to belong. I want to feel like I have meaning, like I'm, I'm contributing. I'm part of a community. What else do you want? Well, more money would be nice. Money is number four when these surveys have been asked. And yet money the flow of money through the community, through our economy, is what we count with GDP. We're not counting whether or not people are happier. We're not counting whether or not people are better off, whether they're healthier. We're not counting whether or not we feel connected to each other, whether we have belonging. We're counting the wrong damn thing. And we attribute success to whether or not you have more money. Now, to some extent, this comes out of the old Calvinist religious philosophy that if you're rich, it's a sign you're blessed by God. Yeah, really? That's not exactly the, uh, the teachings of Jesus that I read in the Bible. And that theory, that belief, got embedded into economics in 1947 when a group of men, 36 of them, gathered outside of Montreux, Switzerland, a place called Mont Pelerin. And, you know, 1947, Europe's in ruins. The, uh, they were trying to do the right thing. They're trying to rebuild a world that has just been in a world war. They said, what matters is individual liberty, freedom. A man named Ludwig von Mises was appalled at what National Socialism had done to trash Europe. A man named Frederick Hayek was scared to death of the rise in the East of Soviet collectivism. And they felt that these were going to crush liberty, personal freedom, the ability of the individual to make individual decisions within the marketplace, which they said is perfect. Now, if the market is perfect and the individual is all that matters, you don't need government. The role of government is to have a military to protect you. And... This, they said, is the core of the way we ought to organize economics. They called this neoliberalism. They were building on the so-called liberal economists, Adam Smith, Ricardo, Pareto. They had a belief in a, what was argued as science, that humans are greedy bastards. But that's okay, they said, because the market is perfect. And in a perfect market, you against me will somehow aggregate to the greater good for all. No, it won't. It hasn't. This theory of neoliberalism, which now dominates global economic thinking, is crushing life on Earth. It's crushing our humanity. And it turns out the science is wrong. Dr. Paul Lawrence at Harvard, Dr. Michael Pearson at Fordham have shown that, yeah, humans have a desire to acquire. And once you've acquired something, you have a desire to defend it. 
But they said this is only half of what makes us human. We also have a desire to bond, and we have a desire to create meaning, to tell story. And we know this is true from the archaeology, the anthropology, the evolutionary biology. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, when we were pre-humans, there were apparently many tribes of pre-humans. Most of them went extinct. And the pre-humans were down to as few numbers as the now highly endangered mountain gorillas. The tribe that survived, and we know this from the DNA, cared about each other. They found the skull in this cave in Southern Africa of an old toothless man. He was old and he was toothless. What use is he to the tribe? If you're only in it for yourself, are you gonna carry along, feed, take care of an old toothless man? They found skeletons of cripples. Why on earth would you keep a cripple around if it's just you? These people cared and they were our ancestors. When you care, it's because that's what it means to be human. Their DNA is in you. There's so a the neolibs are wrong. Mm -hmm. This whole theory of austerity and squeezed blood out of a turnip mm -hmm. and too bad about those poor people. That's wrong. That, that's There's bad. That. There's, I was just going to say, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's a quote in your book that I love. We have created a society that seeks to meet non-material needs with material things. Dana Meadows. Dana yeah. pointed out that we think we can find happiness and belonging by buying things. It's called shopping therapy. So after 9-11, Mr. Bush said, go shopping. Right. And economically, he was actually right. If there's a crisis and you behave as if there's no crisis, economically, there's no crisis. But humanistically, he was wrong. And so Dr. Michael Pearson has developed this whole new approach called humanistic management of how do you do business in ways that enhance in all of us what it is that makes us human and what it is that makes life worth living. And doing that, we now know, is what gives you greater profitability. That ought not to be the reason you do it, but if, all, if you're Milton Friedman and all you care about is that bottom line, it meets that as well. Right. Let's talk about, let's, let's dig into the issue of inequality. You know, you were kind of referencing that, that social network that, you know, I, living here in Europe, have more of a sense of that than certainly the kind of vitriol and things that we're hearing in the United States right now. And I wanted to say that when I was reading A Finer Future this weekend, I kept reflecting on our shared experience living through COVID, where you can't even imagine an international crisis that could so thoroughly expose the fissures and fault lines of so many systems and conditions of our society. And, you know, one of those fault lines we were witnessing clearly arises from this tremendous inequality that is systematically baked into so many aspects of our cultural life, our financial and civic life. We're, we're seeing that in the terrifying impacts of COVID and in our poor communities where people are experiencing much greater health risks and higher mortality rates. The same people that are much less likely to have good health insurance or maybe even health insurance at all we, you know, I think about our service economy where so many jobs are being lost by folks who don't have any financial resources to fall back on. The horrid conditions that have been exposed in industrial ag slaughterhouses to even Black Lives Matter and all it's teaching us about systematic racism that is so entrenched in our communities and society that even those of us who consider ourselves progressive are realizing how much we have been blind to. 
And you have been so clear, and it comes through in so much of your work, that we can't hope to achieve our goals for a regenerative future without the core value of dignity and equality for all people. Can you speak a little bit about that, please? Sure. There's a marvelous woman at Harvard named Dr. Donna Hicks, who, whose work is around dignity and the extent to which this is core to what we all truly value. She points out that most conflict in society, whether it be corporate conflict or world wars, it comes from someone having their dignity undervalued. Mm -hmm. That ensuring, enshrining human dignity is core to achieving what, what any of us want. And if you put this into economics, we have allowed this neoliberal ideology to sweep the world with, again, this Calvinist notion that if you're rich, God has blessed you. Therefore, if you're poor, it must be your fault. It's not on me to take care of you. You're poor. And we are now seeing the results of that. And again, in a completely self-interested way, the spread of COVID around the world has come from failing to have the resilient systems in place that we know where, where these have been implemented. New Zealand, for example, COVID has been vanquished. Mm -hmm. We know how to do it. And by the way, the, interestingly, the countries where they have the best results in dealing with COVID all turn out to be run by women. Well, I don't know if this is causative, but it's a hell of a close correlation. And I'm part of a team that is looking into this. Now, we have allowed a system that systemically builds inequality, allows racism, promotes racism. So I have a tiny taste of what it's like to be discriminated against being a woman, but it's only tiny compared to the experience of people of color, of indigenous people, the world around who suffered under this cheater capitalism, the, the earliest forms of capitalism, the Dutch East India Company, the British East India Company, were corporations formed to go to someone else's land, exploit the people, enslave them, steal their resources, and bring it home to deliver wealth to a very select few stockholders. These were the first stockholding companies. So in many ways, this whole economic edifice rests on inequality, rests on racism, rests on exploitation. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we just have to admit, own up to, and then think deeply about what would a system be that is not racist, that is truly equal, that builds in enhancement of dignity, enhancement of well-being. Mm -hmm. Buckminster Fuller talked about creating a world that works for 100% of humanity. What would that look like? So the four of us took a crack at laying out how do you get to such a world in the book, A Finer Future. We're, we're only beginning to put in place some of the foundation stones of such a world. This is going to be the work of all of us if we wish to continue this human experiment. The good news, though, again, as I keep saying, is we have all the technologies we need to solve the most proximate crises and to begin building this wor world that works for all. That seems like a good place to move into talking about that notion of the second half of the title of your, your book, A Finer Future, Creating an Economy in Service to Life. And, you know, as you pointed out, we, the, the people and the planet, are really in service to the economy, which is in service to finance. 
instead of designing an economy that is in service to life. So we've got it completely backwards. And, you know, frankly, as you point out, it's actually worked quite well. It's working the way it was designed. It's quite efficient um, and externalizing true costs, exploiting human and natural resources, as you just talked about, enriching those very few at the very top. And, you know, reinforcing this, this culture of consumerism that values material possessions over life experiences. So this is a big question, uh, Hunter, but how do we reform our financial system to be in support of the values that we hold, like flourishing within the parameters of a healthy, thriving planet, ensuring universal well-being by, by all, meeting the basic needs of humans and ensuring dignity and equality for everyone? And you have 10 minutes to answer that question. No, I'm kidding. Well, you After that, I'm going to ask you about the meaning of life, just, <laughs> just to warn you. <laughs> I think the meaning of life is service, hence the phrase in service to life. I think you start with foundational building blocks. And I am as much a student in this as I am someone arguing for it. In, uh, in 2012, the Little Kingdom of Bhutan asked a group of us, headed up by the ecological economist, uh, Dr. Robert Costanza, the uh, great scientist, Dr. Jacqueline McGlade, asked about 40 of us to come to Bhutan and help them figure out how to take Bhutan's concept of gross national happiness and embed it as the basis of global development policy. And for a variety of reasons, largely political internal to Bhutan, that effort kind of wandered off, but it engendered a conversation. And while I was there, the, the king of Bhutan said to me, Hunter, your job is to reinvent the global economy. <laughs> said me? So when I came back to the States, I started asking everybody I knew, how would you do that? I, I really had no earthly clue. And as part of that, I tracked into a man named John Fullerton. John was for 18 years at J.P. Morgan, walked away from it in 2001, left as managing director. He said, there, there is just something rotten in the core of how we do finance. So he created a little group called Capital Institute to try to transform finance. And... I ran into John when he had just released a paper called Regenerative Capitalism and read it on a fly into Germany, wrote him and said, John, wow, in 40 odd years of doing this work, this is the best that I have found. And I would highly recommend to all of you that you read John's paper, Regenerative Capitalism. If you don't have well, I was going to say, if you don't have the time, um, John is one of the co-authors of A Finer Future. And we put the Cliff Notes version of his regenerative capitalism in the book. He outlines eight principles drawn from how nature does business. He points out that the economy that we have is this little linear process inside of society, inside of the biosphere. This is again the core of Costanza's ecological economics. John says what we need is right relationship, a phrase created by a guy named Peter Brown, that the relationship between the economy, the society, and the biosphere is critical. The relationship between us as we do business is critical. The relationship to our body is critical. The context between mind, body, that there, in, throughout life there are so many of these relationships that have to be right. I guess it's an old Buddhist concept. Yes. Empowered participation. If you don't have a say in the systems that are impacting you, it, it's not going to work. It may work for a few, it's not going to work for everyone. This is uh, the work of uh, the great group in the UK, Equality Trust, uh, Drs. Uh, 
Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, who show that unequal societies have more of everything you don't want, murder, suicide, early childhood death, maternal death, social dislocation, and that more equal societies have more well-being. They have a series of TED Talks that are, that are great. The um, book out called The Spirit Level, uh, new book out as well, that uh, if, you, if you care about how do you dive into these questions of, of equality and equity, very important work. Edge effect abundance. This is this uh, biomimetic concept that in nature, the most abundant ecosystems are where several of them come together, where a river meets the ocean in an estuary or a meadow meets a forest. They are abundant because they are diverse. And this concept of diversity is, is one of these core natural principles. Balance between efficiency and resilience. Nature is, in many ways, both efficient and resilient. But if you're all the way to one side of the scale or the other, then it doesn't work as well. Holistic wealth. Money is useful, but money is not wealth as we were saying, wealth is well-being, it's belonging. And the concept that I think is most important, although John stresses all of these principles are part of a holistic system, they all work together, you can't pick any one of them out, honors, place, and community. We can have a vibrant global economy so long as every place within that economy has its own integrity. And this integrity is, again, it gets back to this concept of dignity, the concept of a whole system. And I'm very fond of good Scottish whiskey. We make whiskey here in Colorado, but so long as the Colorado agriculture has its own integrity, I don't mind buying Scottish whiskey. You put all of these pieces together, these core eight principles of regenerative capitalism, and I think you have the foundation of framing policy that will lead us to a, a finer future. So a group of us were asked here in Colorado as part of the Alliance Center to work with the governor's office to lay out a roadmap to a regenerative recovery. And we had a whole series of working sessions and we're in the process of writing up the final report. We found some very interesting things. Colorado likes to think of itself as an extractive industry state. Our oil and gas industry have, has for years said, you can't limit us. We are the heart of the Colorado economy. We create jobs. So we looked, turns out, Arts and culture provide twice the jobs of oil and gas. Outdoor industries, six times the number of jobs of oil and gas. Craft brewing provides almost as many jobs as oil and gas. The Colorado economy is already shifting toward a more regenerative economy. And I suspect the economy of where you live is doing the same thing. So what kind of an economy do we want? in the future? What kind of jobs do we want? Renewable energy is the fastest growing job category the world around and is half of solving the climate crisis. Provides 10 times the number of jobs of investing in any central station power plant. Regenerative agriculture. We now know that communities that are more committed to organic regenerative agriculture have a higher level of prosperity than communities that are based on industrial farming. In the COVID crisis, what collapsed? It was the industrial agricultural supply chain. Little local farm stands have been doing very well. And yet when you look at subsidies, around the world we spend a million dollars a minute subsidizing industrial agriculture. We ought to start redirecting these flows of money into the ability of every community to have its own food security. 
ending food deserts in minority communities, enabling people to have more participation in growing their own food, ensuring the health and the nutritional density of food. And again, when you, when you start looking at the economics, this is better business. There's a great story of a man named Gabe Brown. Gabe was going broke, commodity farming, corn, soybeans. He said, look, I'm going broke, I'll try anything. Somebody had suggested that he listen to the work of a man named Alan Savory. And so Gabe started looking at this. First, he stopped breaking the soil, the native prairie soil, and turning it upside down, which decarbonizes, denitrifies the soil. And he went to no-till. This dramatically cut his cost. He then started planting cover crops and then deep rooted cover crops. These roots can go meters into the soil. Then he had all this stuff growing on his fields, so he turned out his cows to eat the cover crops down so he could drill seed his corn soybeans. Gabe went on some of his plots from a little under 2% soil organic matter to over 11%. Incredible. Every 1% soil organic matter is five tons of carbon and 20,000 gallons of water holding capacity. That's Gabe right. is rolling climate change backward at a profit. Now listen, I'm so glad you brought up regenerative agriculture. I just have to do as Celine bids me, and I'm reminded that we're, all, we're a little over halfway through the program, so I just want to take a quick break to remind everyone that this is Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change. I'm your guest host, Elizabeth Candelario, speaking with Hunter Lovins, a lifelong sustainability warrior, educator, and author. So, hey, you and I could have dedicated this whole interview talking about agriculture, especially its role to climate, which I know is definitely a passion for both of us. And I love that you brought up Savory Institute um, and, and their work, which is incredible all over the world, and its influence on farmers like Gabe Brown in building back soil, and even the need um, absolutely for the integration of livestock in order to do that work. So it's maybe hoping that you could touch on that um, and share your thoughts. Sure. When the pioneers came across the Great Plains of the United States, they found about three meters worth, 10 feet worth of thick black soil. That black is carbon. How did it get there? It turns out it got there by the interaction, the co-evolution of grasslands and grazing animals. When a grazing animal eats a plant, the roots slough polysaccharide, sugars, that feeds the microbiological community in the soil, particularly a thing called mycorrhizal fungi, the glomalin in the soil. That living soil is what mineralizes the carbon that's coming from either decaying biomass or these sugars that the roots are sloughing. When you have a grazing herd in prehistoric times. They're dense packed because in the Great Plains, the bison were being eaten by wolves. And if you're about to get eaten, the safe place to be is in the middle of the herd. Everybody's trying to get there. They eat everything in front of them. They trample everything under them. They fertilize everything behind them and they move on. They don't come back until the grass has regrown. Science out this last year shows that where the bison are grazing in Yellowstone, the national park, they're actually extending spring by several months worth because they eat all the grass and then it regrows. This process, whether it be wildebeests in Africa or sega antelope across the Eurasian steppes, this is what decarbonized the planet's atmosphere. We used to have 400 parts per million concentration of CO2, which is actually a little below where we are now. And we got down to 280 parts per million concentration of CO2 because of this action of plants and grazing animals, grass in particular. Grass has 40 times the carbon per weight of a tree 
Bamboo, by the way, is a grass. So you can ranch farm bamboo, take the bamboo, turn it into flooring or wallboard or any of the uses of bamboo, and you're taking carbon out of the air. Or you can eat grass beef. When you do that, the grazing action of the grass beef is putting carbon back into the soil. Now, if you take a cow, which is on grass, there is in the grass stuff called methanotropic bacteria. Yeah, cows burp and fart and blow out methane. And a cow with its head down in the grass blows that burp right into the methanotropic bacteria and the cow is, by the action of eating, by fertilizing, putting carbon back into the soil. Take that cow, put it in a feedlot, feed it corn or soybeans, which cows were never designed to eat. They're designed to eat grass. No methanotropic bacteria, same amount of burping and farting, actually a bit more because now you're making the cow sick by feeding them this stuff they weren't designed to eat. Now you have a cause of climate change. How do you fix it? Stop feedlotting beef. Just that one step, just leaving cows on the farm, on the ranch where they were designed to be on the grass, having little local slaughterhouses around, cow has a very happy life until suddenly it's dead. And you get beef that is higher in concentrated linoleic acids, omega-3 oils. Grass beef actually is better for you than eating salmon. What's not to like? And you now have healthy rural communities, higher quality of life. Again, th these are all approaches, technologies that work, that are more profitable. Oh, by the way, Gabe is now wildly profitable. Take a look at Will Harris, Bluffton, Georgia, also works with Savory. Will had a fifth generation cattle farmer and he said, I just, I don't like how we're doing this. We raise up these cows and then we ship them off to a feedlot. He said, I'm gonna leave them on grass and build my own little slaughterhouse. He now ships to Whole Foods as far away as Chicago. You can go mail order. Nurtured by Nature is Gabe Brown. White Oak Pasture is Will Harris. And you can order healthy food over the internet. Or go meet your local farmer rancher and do this. Now doing this is more labor intensive. Will has 137 employees on a 2,500 acre piece of ground. His neighbor commodity peanut farmer, same acreage, four employees. Will is building community and producing healthy food. And he's really funny <laughs> for those people that are listening. I know a lot of people that are listening have met Will and he's just such an inspiration to everybody. Will is a uh, So like I said, I could spend the rest of the time talking to you about ag, but I'm gonna move on now because I do wanna to talk to you, you know, we talked about economic transformation and we talked about regenerative ag. I'd really like to talk about corporate transformation. I know that there's a number of business leaders that will be listening in in our conversation today. You actually are the person who coined the term integrated bottom line and have made the argument quite eloquently that corporate commitment to sustainability enhances shareholder value, has lower risks, better ability to, to attract and retain employees, stronger brand equity cons and consumer support. But I've heard the analogy that asking a CEO to really transform their business approach is akin to asking a pilot to retrofit her plane mid-flight during increasing turbulence while ensuring that the crew and the passengers on board feel safe and happy. What guidance can you give to folks who want to start incorporating these strategies to align their company with regenerative values, but aren't exactly sure how to start. The phrase integrated bottom line was, it actually owes to a woman named uh, Theo Ferguson. A man named Walter Link and I were working with Theo and she popped out with this line and I said, that's great, I'm gonna steal it. 
And Walter and I wrote a paper on some of these concepts and have been fooling around with this, implementing it in various companies. Walter and a team of 100 or so leading sustainability thinkers have put together a new group called Now Partners. And I guess the website just launched yesterday where we work with companies to help them implement these kinds of ideas in ways that are profitable for the company. Companies that don't are going to find themselves under increasing pressure, under boycotts, under loss of corporate value. And so what you do for each company is different, but put together, we know how to help a company walk through all of this. So I, you know, as you mentioned, I've done this work with a number of very large companies, also a number of, of very small companies. I've been working of late with a little battery company out in Oxnard, California called Simplify Power. They make this really cool technology, lithium ion ferrous phosphate. You, know, you may know that when you travel on it, well, when we used to travel on airplanes, they would say you can't check lithium ion batteries in your checked luggage. That's lithium ion cobalt chemistry, which gets hot. You know, you uh, hold your phone up to your ear, it gets hot. That's lithium ion cobalt. These little batteries don't get hot. So the Department of Defense uses them in places like Afghanistan. If you, uh, you don't want somebody to shoot a heat seeking missile at you, you don't want a diesel generator that's sitting there getting hot and you don't want a battery bank that's sitting there getting hot, these guys don't get hot. So the company asked if I would help them with strategy. And I said, if you're going to frame a strategy, why don't you do some scenario planning? This is a tool invented by Royal Dutch Shell, where you consider everything that could impact the company, as well as everything internal. So you look at these, uh, factors within the company. Who are your customers? What's your market? What's your supply chain? You look at the world at large. So they call it, uh, Shell calls it steep, social, technological, economic, environmental, and political. And I've shrunk this down to a four-hour process. When Shell does it, they take five years to do a rolling set of scenario plans. Most companies don't have that kind of time or commitment of personnel. So I've shrunk it to a very manageable little process, which also turns out to be a ton of fun. And we ran this with Simplify. They brought all of the staff together, and that in itself is a great employee engagement tool. But they were, they were being fairly conventionally minded. They're a manufacturing company. And I said, guys, get a little wild and crazy. What could happen? What have you not thought of? Don't worry about Martians landing on the lawn, not likely. But what if there's a pandemic? This was November last year. The CEO rolled her eyes. But then she got to thinking. And in December, when she started to hear about this unknown disease in China, and they got a lot of their um, components from China. Mm -hmm. She thought, what if? China were to shut down. Why don't we order in extra inventory? What if it came here? What would that do to our workforce? What do I have to start putting in place now? And indeed, COVID hit. California shut down. The plant was shut for two days. They were deemed an essential industry, and they were back up and running because they had done the thinking ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And in scenario planning, you tell stories. These are not forecasts. I was not forecasting a pandemic. When this thing hit, I was as surprised as anybody else. Uh, Catherine Von Berg, the CEO, called me up and said, you did this. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of power. She thinks you have a crystal ball under your desk, probably. No, I don't. And people are asking me now, what's going to happen in the election? Like, yes. oh, God. Exactly. <laughs> no You're going to save that. that for the next broadcast. Get on, get out there and vote is what's going to, I'm going to try to make happen in this election. But thinking 
in a disciplined way about what are plausible, mutually inconsistent futures is an incredibly powerful tool. So we have this whole toolkit that we can bring to companies and help them begin to move up this ladder of moving from where they are now, what's sometimes been called pre-compliant, i.e. you're breaking the law, past compliance, that used to be called corporate responsibility, through efficiency, being a little more green, through what has been called corporate sustainability, which is the ability to keep doing this ever after, through being restorative of the systems that we have been degrading, human and natural capital, until you become a truly regenerative company based on these eight principles of John Fullerton. I think it's so great that you really um, challenge leadership to use their imagination. I, I think a lot about how our failure for leadership and innovation is really based on a failure of imagination. And I know personally, you know, I get sucked into all the bad news, worrying about our planet, what kind of a future we're leaving for our children, our most basic inability to even get on the same page as a society around science, all of the political craziness, and it can feel really bleak and overwhelming. But I'm also a strategy person, and I know quite well that in order to really come up with a most successful roadmap, we need to understand what our destination is. And, you know, my work with clients, I'll often pose the query, it's 10 years from now, you wake up and you're really excited about your day. You, you can't believe the progress that you've made. You know, you're so passionate about your work, about your community, about your life. Describe your world. So I was so tickled, Hunter, in your book, A Finer Future, because that's really how you start. I really appreciated that. You started with this, telling this beautiful and powerful story about somebody waking up, I don't know how many years uh, in advance, but a ways down the road, and de describing this beautiful vision of the reality they were living in. So I really wanted to ask you if you could share with our listeners your vi vision of the future. Well, it wasn't so much mine. I wrote the traditional, really, no kidding, we're in trouble, here are all the challenges we're facing. And the early readers said, we can't get through this. I just put it down. Okay, what if we made it? It's 2050. You're an 80-year-old woman waking up in a co-housing development in Jakarta. And the skies are clear because they're no longer burning the rainforest. Companies like Unilever have discovered that sustainable home plantations, small scale, run by local villages, done in ways that enhance orangutan habitat, are more profitable to them than the, the, the massive monocultural rainforest burning palm plantations they had been doing. And a young woman uh, who has come over to the United States from Africa to take her MBA at the Bard MBA, stepping off a pub, uh, public transit running along Broadway in New York City and talking to the young woman who is harvesting greens from the community gardens that run up and down the streets that used to have cars on them and just painted a whole series of little vignettes heavily footnoted. Everything that I put in there is happening today somewhere around the planet. Again, we know how to do all of this stuff. And increasingly, in many ways, the, the COVID pandemic is a complete and utter tragedy. We, we are losing so many of us. In another way, it is an obligation to all of us to fundamentally rethink how did we get in this mess, and what can we do to get out of it, and to use these tools. So renewable energy was crawling its way uphill against the fossil behemoth. 
if you think we put a lot of money into subsidizing industrial agriculture, it's $5.2 trillion a year that go into subsidizing fossil energy around the world. This is your and my tax dollars that we're wasting, that we're blowing out as climate destruction. And even in the face of that, renewable energy is winning mm -hmm. to the point that the, the current winner of what I call the Walmart Award for Everyday Low Price, which is now Dubai, with solar panels at 1.35 cents a kilowatt hour, less than one and a half cent per kilowatt hour. The electricity you pull out of your wall, you're probably paying at least 12 cents a kilowatt hour for. And just running a natural gas plant to produce it costs five to six cents a kilowatt hour. 1.3 cents a kilowatt hour. Here in Colorado, our coal loving utility, Excel Energy, put out a all source bid. We need 1100 megawatts, everybody bid. They knew gas would win. Gas came in at four cents. Solar came in a bit above two, wind a bit below two, wind plus solar plus storage, three cents a kilowatt hour. When you add batteries into the renewables, now you have fixed firm power. Excel said, no, bid it again. They did, 58,000 megawatts bid, three cents a kilowatt hour. Excel said, huh, can we, uh, Pledge to go two thirds renewables. The Public Utility Commission said, sure. Now they have said we're gonna go 100% renewable, but over a longer period of time. But with this much renewable energy coming on, they ought to do it this year. So we now have whole cities looking at how do I become 100% renewably powered? The city of Amsterdam hired Kate Rayworth who has this concept of donut economics. You have to be below the planetary boundaries. This is the work of Johan Rockström and the scientists at Stockholm Resilience Potsdam Institute. And you have to be above the human minimums to ensure dignity. That gives you a donut shaped space, what Kate calls this safe and regenerating operating space for humanity. So Amsterdam said, how do we take the concept of donut economics and use that as the basis of our recovery. Sandrine Dixon de Clev, who runs the Club of Rome, has been taking these same concepts and building them into a proposal for how do you implement the European Green Deal. We're doing it here in Colorado. The city of Los Angeles is looking at using donut economics. These concepts of building a more regenerative society, creating an economy and service to life are starting to take hold. And this is what gives me hope. I do wake up every morning charged to get about it because we can do it. I really appreciate your incredible uh, positivity. We all need a little bit more of that in our lives these days, especially. And I would uh, encourage all the people who are listening to this to spend more time, to at least try to spend more time envisioning the kind of future that Hunter is speaking to instead of worrying so much about things that, that we can uh, not do a lot about except in our own individual path that we're on in the work working that we do. So Hunter, I just wanna say personally, I'm so delighted to meet you. I am very grateful for your dedication, your hard work, your passion, you're just fantastic. I recommend to everybody to try to look up Hunter's books. They're on uh, Amazon. Um, or at your local bookstore. Or at your local bookstore. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Celine Diaz for inviting us here today. Um, that's uh, Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change. Elizabeth, thank you. The Regenerative Voices Elevating Stories Activating Change podcast series is produced by At the Epicenter, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. Make a tax deductible donation or sign up as a monthly supporter by visiting at theepicenter.com slash donate. 
Support packages start at $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. To become a podcast sponsor, visit attheepicenter.com slash contact to let us know of your interest. If you found this podcast episode insightful and meaningful, please pass it on by sharing it with a friend or colleague who will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in, for your support, and for activating change.